Welcome everyone to this speaker series on negotiating with state and non-state military counterparts. It's really a great pleasure to welcome you today. Just for your information, the presentations will be recorded, but not the question and answer part. So feel free to ask the questions that are on your mind. To introduce myself, my name is Fierala. I am the head of operations of the CCHN and I will be your host today. Unfortunately, I have to facilitate another session at 3 p.m. So my colleague Rehan, who is also on the call, will be managing the question and answers and the closing of the event. And allow me to quickly hand over to my colleague Mathilde, who is the tech host of this event, and she will give you the instructions for the automatic interpretation. Mathilde, the floor is yours. Thanks, Shirela. So I've put it in the chat. I'm going to put it again, if you want um to the live uh, transcription of what the guest will say either in french or in spanish so you go on the link uh, i'll put it again it's very easy you join uh you select french or spanish and uh, you will see the transcription um when people will be talking in the language you chose so that's really it Thank you so much, Mathilde. And I see many, many familiar faces who are already part of the CCHN community, but we also have a few new colleagues on board who are not yet part of the CCHN community of practice. Also, a warm welcome to you. So therefore, I will just give a very, very quick introduction who we are at the Center of Competence on Humanitarian Negotiation. The CCHN is it's a strategic partnership between the ICRC, WFP, UNHCR, and Doctors Without Borders, and we foster peer learning on humanitarian negotiations across agencies, and we're building a global community of practice. In our spe speaker series, we also want to learn about the views of our counterparts, how they perceive us, how they see us as humanitarian negotiators, so that we can better engage with armed actors and, of course, access vulnerable people. As such, we provide a platform of exchange where we bring in different views and voices that do not necessarily represent the views of the CCHN and its partners, but we believe in hearing this diversity so that we can all become better negotiators. For this speaker series on negotiating with state and non-state military counterpart, we have started the series with Stephen Kilpatrick from the ICRC, who spoke about military ranks, credo, discipline. Um, we had Duncan Spinner, who is a director of a private security company, who spoke about negotiations with private security and private military companies. And I'm particularly pleased and proud today of our two absolutely fascinating speakers, we have retired Colonel Harnett Johannes, who was a freedom fighter in the Tigray People's Liberation Front um, in the struggle that took place from 1974 to 1991, and later served also in the Ethiopian National Army. She became then a legal advisor to the Minister of Defense, and finally became a president of the Ethiopian Military Courts and judge of Appellate Military Court. Later on, she joined the United Nations at, um, at New York headquarters, where she served as a strategic military planning officer for the UN peacekeeping operations in various regions around the world. In particular, she worked for UN missions in Western Africa. Now she volunteers at uh, various community development activities, as well as the American Red Cross, currently based in the US. We also have Ruben Stewart with us, who is a military and armed group advisor at the ICRC in Geneva. He is a former New Zealand Army officer, and more recently, as a humanitarian, he has spent over 20 years in the field um, working in different crisis contexts. That experience was characterized by engagement and dialogue with armed actors, primarily armed groups in conflict settings, and especially in urban areas. Um, his work at the ICRC focuses on armed groups, battlefield behavior, IHL pedagogy, and future conflict trends, especially those related to technology. So as you can see, we have wonderful speakers today. We really look forward to hearing from them. And, and with that, Ruben, I will give you the floor. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much, and it's uh, my pleasure to be here today. Um, hopefully you can all see my screen. Um, I'm going to try to avoid the use of slides too much, but I wanted 
to take the opportunity to emphasize two key points. Um, I have been engaging with non-state armed groups even when I was still serving in the military uh, in regards to the, um, the what were the freedom fighters in East Timor in the late 90s, um, and then moved on to work with the UN, uh, engaging with the Northern Alliance in Afghanistan, and then spent, uh, as Foriella said, you know, a, a couple of decades effectively in the Middle East, engaging with non-state armed groups and armed groups of all all shapes and sizes, as it were. Um, one of the things that often strikes me as uh, quite interesting is that uh, many humanitarians treat armed groups and non-state armed groups as a very particular uh, type of arms carrier, almost to the exclusion of some of the characteristics that they have in common. And so one point that I will be constantly stressing today is the need uh, to, to look beyond the, the nomenclature, be beyond the title of armed groups, and, and recognize that who we are engaging with are another form of arms carrier, in much the same way that, that CCHN has looked at state armed forces and private military and security companies, armed groups are a, another form of arms carrier. They have slight uh, characteristics that make them different, um, but at the end of the day, they are all arms carriers, and there is a need for us to engage with them because they are so prevalent on today's battlefield. Uh, the key element in any arms carrier uh, engagement starts with assessment, and the assessment needs to be done before constantly updated drawing and must be reviewed post any activity. Um, the assessment is, is not uh, an end in itself, um, but it is a means to an end, okay? And it should be the basis for all of our planning, conduct, and reviewing engagement. There are standard elements that you would look at for any arms carrier in regards to their structure and their organization, um, maybe certainly commanders, those who have influence over them. When it comes to armed groups, it's particularly useful to fo focus on their motivation, their ideology, the influences, which can differ slightly from state armed forces and that those influences are not necessarily codified in doctrine. The impact of command and discipline, and it's often said that armed groups lack a certain level of command and lack discipline, I would argue that it is just a different form of command and different form of discipline. Um, and Hannes and I have had many conversations over the years. Um, I'm sure that she will reiterate that point as well. Um, for armed groups, the support relationships, where they have support relationships, are extremely important. Um, and then their relationship with the population. And I think it's the relationship with the population that probably defines armed groups uh, or separates armed groups in more than any other way than from state armed forces. The relationship that armed groups have with the population is very distinct and very different from state armed forces. And one to keep in mind uh, when doing that assessment in terms of how it is that you will engage with them. Um, but I will keep on coming back to the assessment because I don't think that's an area that we as humanitarians do enough of. And if we do do it, we pay lip service to it and make a lot of assumptions. One of the uh, uh, studies done by ICRC back in 2018 was called The Roots of Restraint. And what that chose to look at was what were the elements that restrained an armed force or an armed group's behavior when it came to the protection of civilians or compliance with IHL? And it looked at four sort of key factors. That was the type of authority that existed within the group, the nature of the hierarchy within the group, the nature of discipline, and then also the degree of social isolation. And by looking at those four factors, the ICRC determined that there were four 
key types of armed groups organizations. And we'll quickly go through those from left to right. The integrated one on the left is very hierarchical. Um, it has a highly codified uh, set of rules, including doctrine. Um, it's quite obvious uh, in terms of its uniform and its routines that it is an armed group. Uh, and they often have uh, quite separate and distinct from civilian life. And this is obviously something that state armed forces, you know, most state armed forces fall within this criteria. We then have centralized forces or groups where the leadership exercises of command and control through a hierarchy, as you can see from the diagram there. They do have doctrine, they do have ideology, um, and they do have some uniforms and some professionalism, for example, but slightly less so than an integrated uh, force. You can probably guess, you know, there are many militaries that are centralized in that respect and many armed groups that are also centralized in terms of they, they meet those criteria as well. Next on the list, we have decentralized groups. And this is where there are smaller armed groups who have individual commanders who retain considerable decision-making power over the group as a whole. You know, those small groups will work together. Um, they might break away and form new groups. Um, and there's numerous examples of this. So, for example, I think Al-Qaeda, um, you know, morphed, rejoined, split into various factions over the years. And there's probably at least at, at this stage, you know, some 40 Al-Qaeda affiliated groups operating um, that will work together or not, depending on, uh, on, on the circumstances. But that coordination is quite loose. The military planning is, is not quite the same as it is for integrated and centralized units. And there's, from the outside at least, there's few observable, uh, or there's, there's less evidence of them being a, a military force. They don't necessarily wear uniforms. They don't necessarily go salute each other. They don't have that daily routine. And then last of all, we have community embedded groups. And these are small groups from a local community, um, or sorry, a small number of fighters formed into groups from a local community. They're often formed to defend community interests. They have quite a flat hierarchy where a leaders are sometimes elected and sometimes appointed by community leaders. Um, they often move in and out of the roles of fighter and civilian on a regular basis. And they don't often have codes of conduct that are written. They often rely on local values and norms, for example, to guide their behavior. So these categories are very useful. And if you go to the Roots of Restraint online, you will find that each of these categories actually have recommendations about how to engage with groups of these sort or uh, armed forces of these sort to give you pointers and indicators about what can be the most effective way of reaching them and persuading them. They are very generic categories though. Um, and armed forces can change uh, over time or indeed they might have elements that are similar at the same time. So Al-Shabaab, for example, has a very really, um, highly disciplined core, what we, we would call a centralized, but then they also have smaller units on the periphery who are have close ties and loyalty to the clans, for example. So it would be more decentralized or community embedded. But this is the framework when you're undertaking that assessment to help you understand uh, the type of group and how it is that you might best approach them. Um, I'm actually gonna call it quits there. Uh, that's enough talking from me and I'm sure you have lots of questions. Um, and I'm sure you will have a lot of interest in what Hanet has to say um, so I will pass the floor over to her now. Thank you. So first of all, I would like to thank you uh, just for giving me this opportunity to share my experience uh, of uh, humanitarian negotiation with state and non-state military. Uh, as through the introduction, Fiorella said, um, I, am, I was a freedom fighter during the 17 years of armed struggle in northern Ethiopia, Sigray. 
and I was non-state army in this case to use the um, the word non-state army. And after the 17 years of armed struggle, I became uh, a member of the national army because the struggle was concluded with the victory of the armed struggle. So um, it is really a great uh, opportunity what we to, to, to share what we are doing in terms of humanitarian crisis and humanitarian assistance, humanitarian action we took. So my uh, basis for my presentation is the 17 years armed struggle of the people of Tigray, Ethiopia, North 1991. Uh, it looks like I'm sharing uh, an experience of more than a situation of more than 40, 45 years. I'm talking about this situation, but it is as fresh experience as yesterday uh, to me, as it is very important uh, uh, at this time also at, this, uh, at our today's world, because today the world is still suffering by uh, internal conflicts, armed conflicts. So the experience of uh, more than 40, 45 years is still a fresh and very helpful to consider. Uh, so the non-state army of the struggle, uh, as Ruben indicated, like types of um, armed groups, whatever, it can be the state army or non-state army. The non-state army of the Zen uh, Tigray People's Liberation Front was very organized, centralized, with code of conduct, with ideology, with hierarchy, and uh, with a clear objective why the army is fighting for. So it helps these non-state army members to have a very strong communication and relationship with the local community it was functioning or it was operating. Uh, and the problem, ha what happened in the, in the people, in the local community affects the army, the non-state army at that time. Whenever the people are okay, the army is okay because they are going. They are. They, they are working. They were working together for the same purpose, for the same uh, objective. So uh, this is what I'm going to talk about and how humanitarian agencies reach out the victims of the humanitarian crisis during this time. There was a situation where there was a big um, humanitarian disaster, natural disaster, together with the conflict. So. This uh, humanitarian negotiation with non-state army was there. So I will I will try to um, envisage uh, what happened and what was done by the humanitarian uh, activities. The 1994, 1984 to 1985, there was a big drought and famine in Northern Ethiopia, in Ethiopia in general, but mostly affected where the north part of Ethiopia. And during this time, there was a, a very, very uh, critical and non-stop war, non-stop fighting. And at the same time, the people were suffering of famine, drought, and there was no humanitarian aid, access to humanitarian aid because of the central government or the Zen regime, military regime of Mengistu Haile Mariam was uh, not allowing any aid to enter, to, to, to reach to those conflict affected areas because these areas were not under the control of the central government. It was controlled by the uh, then non-state army or the organization was functioning like a de facto government. It, the central government was not controlling these areas. So in, 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 in practice, in reality, the northern region where the rebellion was taking place was under siege. So 
no humanitarian access, no aid or food, no nothing. It was under uh, a very critical and complex situation of humanitarian crisis. At this time, what was done when I remember this time in 1984 to 1985, Tigray region was, was under siege. There was no access to humanitarian aid. And there was no, also a negotiation between the fighting groups, that is the central government and the Tigray People's Liberation Front, because the government was not willing to cease fire for a while for humanitarian ceasefire and to support these people. What happened is because the world was very much concerned, the member states were very much concerned, they came through Sudan. Through Sudan, there was um, uh, a discussion or a negotiation where I'm putting in a quotation negotiation is the negotiation was not just directly, uh, not with the government, or there was no an issue of please do it or I will not do it. You know, there was no uh, resistance from the Tigray People's Liberation Front to support the people. The Tigray People's Liberation Front was willing, more than willing, to support to get aid access for the people. Therefore, this is a good background. Again, the member states and the, the international community was really committed to support the, uh, pe the people in northern Ethiopia who are suffering of uh, famine and drought. That the 1984-1985 drought was threatening to kill more than 10 million people in that area. So the world was concerned. If you remember, this was the time where uh, we are the world was sunk. Are the world was sunk. It was very critical drought. So the international community and the member states reached out to government of Sudan and the Tigray People's Liberation Front to open a corridor through Sudan to uh, send food aid, medical aid, and other aids to the Tigray region, who are really affected and suffering of drought. At this time, the negotiation, how to open a corridor through Sudan and how to reach out to the conflict affected and uh, drought affected people was done with higher uh, leadership of TPLF, the Tigray Liberation Front. So I remember this uh, situation, uh, like like yesterday, because I was a commander of battalion at that, a, a, a company commander at that time. I was with the army and we were wondering, I was wondering why the world is keeping silent, uh, silent at the moment. Where, where are the humanitarian actors? Where are the humanitarian agencies that are established to support uh, humanitarian crisis uh, and conflict or any humanitarian crisis affected people. So when I see that the uh, uh, corridor from Sudan was open, me and my comrades, my colleagues at that time were so happy. And, you know, we, 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 we see hope that our world is with us. So the negotiation took place with the higher leadership political leadership and higher senior commanders of TPLF. And my role was, my and my unit's role was to uh, provide protection to the humanitarian uh, agencies, to the trucks that are coming through Sudan to reach the, the affected people. And at the same time, it was not easy for the, for the trucks to get into the Tigray because there was no road enough road, proper road. So there must be a rural road construction. So at this moment, the uh, uh, relief of uh, society, relief society of Tigray rest. There was an international and national uh, humanitarian agency uh, belonged to Tigray. Tigray rest, relief society of Tigray rest. Still, it's known. It has an office in Europe, in America, and in Sudan. 
So RES took over the uh, coordination of humanitarian assistance. The army of the PLF, the non-state actor in, in this terminology, was in, uh, assigned to provide protection. Still, the central government was fighting against us, even until the road was constructed, the rural road was constructed, the people had to travel to be close to be closer to the Sudan corridor to get food. So they have to come from the central mountains, the central highlands to uh, Sudan area. We were accompanying these people, even carrying babies and carrying weak people, women and children in our shoulder on, on top of our guns. This was the commitment we showed. This com commitment come from the ideology we follow, from the objectives we had to for democracy and freedom. I mean, what I'm going to tell you is, I don't like to be called a rebel in terms of this, you know, rebel is given to just like bandits or like things, but we were actually, we were rebellion. It was a rebellion, but our commitment, our ideology, our struggle, until we get the truth, you know, in the get to get, we got victory and we overthrow the then military government and we establish a democratic country, regardless of the current situation. So we, the, the army of the non-state army of the TPLF were, you know, providing protection to the trucks, providing protection to the people who were traveling to get the food closer to food until the road was constructed. We were pro providing protection to humanitarian officers, to humanitarian actors who were getting inside Tigray to provide this assistance, to implement the mission of humanitarian assistance. Therefore, our role, my role as a military, as a fighter, and as a unit commanding officer was just providing protection and helping the people you know, there was a bomb. the central government knowing that food aid is coming through Sudan and trucks are coming through Sudan. There was airstrikes against the people who were traveling to get food. There was airstrike against the trucks. And the trucks were obliged to travel at night to avoid them, to, to, the, the, the airstrike. Even when they started traveling in at night, Antonovs were bombing, just to, to give you that uh, uh, situation, what looks like. Anyway, uh, the point is the humanitarian negotiation took place with higher leadership and it was smooth. The negotiation is not, you know, uh, was not really um, challenged by the PLF, not, not challenged. The Sudan allowed, the international community was committed the TPLF was willing to support. So all organized and for, in a coordinated way, the humanitarian assistance reach to the people who are affected. The second point I would like to mention is the 1989-1990 flow of humanitarian aid through the government control. This is a different scenario. The, the drought was continuing until this time and I, as I told you, it, the people were under siege. And in 1989, the region of Tigray was totally liberated from the central government control and it was administered by TPLF. So at that time, there was no food, there was no anything. Everything was blocked. There is no communication with the central government. Then uh, religious humanitarian agencies coordinate a negotiation between the central government to allow access of food aid and the TPLF army, non-state army, also to provide uh, protection without any hindrance, without any obstruction, the food aid to reach the affected people. So this one is a different negotiation. The central government was involved and the humanitarian agencies uh, mediate among the two uh, fighting parties separately, but not the negotiation didn't 
take place between the two conflicting parties, but the mediators reach out to these conflicting parties and uh, gain the access to of aid to reach the uh, affected people. So our role at that time was, again, providing protection and allowing the humanitarian access to reach the affected people without any security obstruction, regardless there was a big fighting, no ceasefire, but the humanitarian uh, aid was reaching the people. Uh, so these are what I remember from the non-state uh, army and humanitarian access negotiation. Uh, as uh, my the introduction of your last said, I became uh, uh, a national army member until the rank of colonel, and uh, I had a chance after victory, after I became the national army member and um, a higher officer and a legal advisor to the minister, I have got the opportunity to to uh, communicate with various uh, humanitarian agencies, because even after I became a national army, there was internal conflict again in other areas of the country, and there was a natural disaster like flood, like drought, and certain uh, several humanitarian agencies wanted to uh, reach out with those people and they wanted to coordinate their works with the army, especially in emergency situations, the army uh, involves, engages itself to, to save the people. And at the same time, due to various, I mean, several uh, internal conflicts, there were detainees and the, some, internal, some humanitarian agencies wanted to visit uh, those detainees. And there was a communication uh, with me uh, as a legal advisor. So it was a direct communication with me, unlike the time where I was a non-state army, I was directly communicating with them and coordinating some uh, uh, activities and advising my senior uh, leadership. So my observation at this time to make it short is the Questions raised by the humanitarian uh, agencies were very clear that their demand was reasonable and appropriate, you know, to visit detainees, to support uh, affected people, which is appropriate. And we were addressing it with due respect. And as we did in, during the armed struggle, we were caring to those humanitarian actors, officers of humanitarian agencies. And they were also respectful, even after I became a national army. My uh, feeling uh, towards their attitude was the same. They were respectful and their demands were reasonable. But as you see in my um, bullet point, my observation is humanitarian agencies are comfortable to communicate or operate with the state actors or agencies and in state control areas. That is unchanged. That was my feeling during the armed struggle. They don't communicate us, they don't reach out to us until the final uh, very huge drought was uh, taking place. But there was bombardment, schools, mosques, and churches were bombarded, but no humanitarian agency in, involved at that time to support the people. But now, so what my observation is, uh, uh, humanitarian agencies, humanitarian actors are more uh, limited in state control areas. Maybe uh, Ruben can challenge me or any other person can challenge me. That is my um, uh, observation. The other point is humanitarian actors' operations are restricted by government. Of course, the, the, uh, I give uh, uh, a reasonable uh, you know, doubt to humanitarian actors, even if they wanted to support, 
their operations are restricted by government authorities. So I feel if that is the case, does it mean independence of humanitarian agencies is jeopardized? So what will be the solution, how they are operating? What it should be the principle of negotiation for humanitarian actors in such a case, when their, their, their movement is restricted, when their operation is restricted by government authorities, what will be the way out? This I will leave to uh, other discussants. <laughs>